Good evening, everyone. We're glad to have everybody here this evening. We're going to begin our Bible study this evening by singing Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. We'll just sing uh, one verse in the chorus. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arm. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arm. from all alarm, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arm. Doug, are you coming? Okay. Good evening. So glad to see so many that have come out in spite of the rain. So we're going to have a, a lesson tonight, uh, our third one in the summer series, and uh, the last the last two that we had have been very, very good, and so we're expecting that tonight. Would you, uh, does anyone have any prayer requests? Alfred? Okay. Lucy. Okay. Would you bow with me, please? Father, we thank you for another opportunity to meet here, to hear a Bible lesson from one of our men. We pray for this summer series, and it's been a good thing for us. And we pray, Father, that we just might continue to grow in our faith and grow in our service and grow in our service to those around us in our community and in all the world. Father, we pray for Lucy and you know her situation. And we pray for Johnny's friend, Alfred Batts. Uh, we pray that you'd bless him in the days ahead. Father, we pray for our shut-ins, for Eloise Gooch and Margie Cummings, Marie Meeks and Louise Sisk. Father, we pray for them and the long time they have been shut in, and we just pray that you'd help us to be a help to them. We pray for Rush and Mary Lee and continue in that, and we pray for Ronald Haxma as the, he's dealing with back pain and other challenges. We pray, Father, for the Biggers family, and uh, we're just wanting to support them in any way that we can, and we just pray Mason will continue to co recover and to be blessed and improvement through the doctors, and uh, they may be able to return here. We pray for Patricia Andrus and her family and their challenges, and we pray for Dana Perkins. We pray for our expecting mothers. We pray for those families, Matthew and Haley and James and Sarah and Will and Joanne. And we pray for the newly baptized, Jade McKnight, Dana Santana, Regina Rojas, Lilani Rodriguez, uh, we thank you for all the people that have been baptized recently and that uh, we just continue to enjoy uh, one another's company and helping one another serve you in the Christian walk. Pray you be with our speaker tonight. We pray you'll 
uh, forgive us all of our sins, and we want to come home to be with you forever when this life is over. We pray in your son's name. Amen. Bendito Señor y Dios, una vez más, te damos muchas gracias, bendito Dios, por la habilidad de poder venir aquí a este lugar con nuestros hermanos a reunirnos, eh, poder aprender de tu palabra, Señor, pero hay algunos de nuestros hermanos que eh, no pueden hacerlo por diferentes impedimentos, Señor. Rogamos, Señor, que les bendigas, eh, especialmente aquellos que están con enfermedades, Señor, y bendito Dios, eh, nos ayudes a asimilar este mensaje que se nos va a dar en esta tarde, bendigas a nuestro hermano que eh, la va a exponer tu palabra y podamos salir ricamente bendecidos de este lugar, Señor. Todo lo rogamos en el nombre de Cristo Jesús. Amén. Me, are you coming? <laughs> Just come up here. Thank you. Oh, well, I've got it here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I can roll now. Yubi has been happily married for seven years and is the proud parent of four daughters. Think they're all here? Amen. In addition to a bustling family life, he also cares for three chickens and a beloved cat. You're a farmer. <laughs> a long time a lifelong member of the church, Yubi was baptized into the body of Christ at the age of ten, fostering a deep and enduring faith from an early age. We look forward to the message. We are so glad you're here at Jersey Village, you and your family. So take it away. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. So I'm very, very grateful to be here this evening. And, uh, too bad the weather is really bad outside, but I thank everyone for making it here, despite the, the condition outside. So, many of us are familiar with um, the man called Moses in the Bible. You see, this man was chosen by God to lead the people out of Egypt. But Moses came up with numerous amount of excuses to avoid it. The one that st stands out well for me is the fact that he told God, he said, I am not a good speaker, and I speak slowly, and I don't use the best words. But God asks Moses, who gives the ability to see, who gives the ability to hear, and who gives the ability to speak? I am the one. You see, I'm not here tonight as the best speaker, neither do I have the best words for you. But I am chosen by God to deliver a message tonight just the way God said to Moses, go and I will be with you and I will give you the best words to say. So I pray that God is with me tonight and gives me the best words to say to you. So the title of our teaching is Preaching with God's Power. I don't know why I picked this topic, but it stood out for me. I like it because... Um, Preaching is what we do every single day. And um, our text for this topic is going to be from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 2, from verse 1 to 5. If anyone has that, um, you can read. 
First Corinthians chapter two from verse one to five. Yes, please. So you see, the aim of this message tonight is to show the power of God in preaching the gospel of Christ. By definition, the word preacher is derived from the Greek word kerux, which means a messenger whose uh, primary job was to convey messages from the king to the people. Our main job today as Christians is to preach the word of God. See, preaching is the proclamation and transmission and communication of God's message from man to man. It is the art and science of spreading the good news of Christ to the lost. God's power in preaching is the evidence or proof that God is with his messengers. You see, when when Paul arrived in Corinthians, he said to the people of Corinth, remember when I first came to you, he did not tell them about Christ with impressive speaking skills and displays of knowledge. In fact, he was weak, fearful, and trembling. He was trying to make the people of Corinthians focus more on the power of God than in the amount of imp- in, than in his own appearances, he made them focus on God's power and not on any amount of impressive human wisdom. You see, in today's world, people who speak well are at a premium. They know how to shape words in order to draw people. They know how to communicate and they know how to influence people. If you have been around such people, you might find yourself believing what they say, whether it is the truth or lies. The clever speaker and the skillful debater, you see, the people of Corinthians were after people that speak with high regards. They idolized clever speakers and skillful debaters. They were more focused on how best people could command their English language than in delivering the word of God. They would spend their own fortunes to hire such people to speak. They wanted to listen to persuasive words than the word of God. But Paul, when Paul showed up in Corinthians, he was more focused on delivering the goodwill message. Many people will like to have pastors or preachers who do not touch their guilty conscience. They would like to have people that speak (coughs) sweet talks to their ears. A lot of people don't like to hear the truth anymore. That's why you see they flock to churches where people go to church to just feel good and then they go home. But Apostle Paul affirms to us in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The word of God is given to us as a tool to use in winning souls. So if your preaching is not accomplishing that in the long run, you are not preaching with the power of God. Preachers are teachers as recorded in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7. Can somebody read that if you have it? So let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7. Mm-hmm. 
So you see, in that portion of the Bible, we see that preachers are teachers. Our main job today as Christians is to teach in spirit and in truth. You are not preaching the word of God or with the power of God if you are scared of speaking the truth to your listeners. So, a lot of people will craft sermons in a manner that they do not want to step on toes. They will craft sermons in a manner that frees them from conviction. They will craft sermons in a manner that they do not want to touch on their own evil ways. So they avoid to touch on what is the truth. When we define the word preacher, the key word here, authoritative, which means delivering a message in a way that is trusted as being accurate and true and with authority. So as Christians, we have to preach with authority. The book of Mark, chapter 1, verse 22, describes this for us. Jesus did not rely on the expertise of others. He spoke the very words of our creator. Can we quickly read um, the book of Mark chapter 1 from verse 22? Mark chapter 1 verse 22. So the point I'm making here is that people... These people, they had teachers before Jesus Christ. But what stood out for them most was that they said this particular person was preaching with all amount of authority. So when you're preaching the word of God, you have to preach with authority. The sole work of preachers today is to pro- proclaim his message as recorded in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. You see, God will not come down anymore to deliver message, messages to people. He's going to use us. Yeah, in a minute. Yeah. God will not come down to deliver messages for us anymore. He will, use, he, will, he will use men to deliver these messages. This is why it's important to pay close attention to those we consider as preachers. You can read Second Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 4, from verse 1 to 5. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound doctrine, Having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And as for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Amen. Amen. So this is the private. This is this is the primary role of us as preachers today. Our job is to win souls to God. And we will not be able to achieve this without speaking in spirit and in truth. Like I said earlier, God will not come down from heaven to deliver messages to people. He will use us to deliver these messages. It is important to realize that a minister's effectiveness is not measured by how eloquent he is on the pulpit. But how good is that? God is not in need of showboats. He's most focused on bringing people closer to him. I'm not being negative against people who do speak well, but ministering the word of God requires more skills. See, in today's world, the Americans are people that call them preachers. They claim to be preaching the word of God. 
But I tell you this evening, they are not preaching the word of God with God's power if they have baggages that are hindering them from delivering it truthfully. We have so many preachers today, like I have a number of them that are listed down here to talk to you guys about today. The emotionally sick preacher. These kind of preachers are only focused on the size of the congregation. They are focused on how big is the, the offering tray. So, they are not focused on delivering the word of God in spirit and in truth. So, their sermon and their teachings are crafted in order to fill their pockets. So, if the offering is low, that means it was a bad Sunday. But if the offering is high, that means it was a good Sunday. This is not the reason why we are called to preach. The driven preacher, this one is focused on his own, on his own success. They are more focused on how popular they become in life or how famous they become in life. How do people rank them or rate them in a society? They are not focused on delivering the word of God. If you are this kind of preacher, you are not preaching with God's power. The fleshly preacher. This kind of preacher never fully dealt with all the issues of the flesh before entering the ministry. Hence, they begin to fall into a lifestyle of sin as a coping mechanism to deal with stress. This is why it is fully important to allow the Lord to walk in what holiness and spiritual, and spiritual maturity into your life before you embark on this journey. This is why you have to drop all the baggages that you have. You have to drop your old ways before you follow Christ. Because you cannot be a speaker of the word and not a doer. The superstar preacher. These kind of pastors have an entourage surrounding them. It's very, very hard for people in the church to access them. They wear the most expensive clothes and drive the best cars. That is their own definition of success as a preacher. They speak as if that they have the, the most important ministry in the world. But I tell you, these kind of preachers cannot deliver the word of God truthfully. So the following are some of the outcomes of preaching with God's power. You see, when you're preaching with God's power, you have the ability to save lost souls. As recorded in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. And can somebody open to Romans chapter 1, verse 16? So the primary role of a preacher is to preach in order to save souls. When you are preaching with God's power, you have the ability to correct. So if you are scared of correcting people, then you should not be preaching the word of God. The word of God, like we, like we, have, we all know, is like a two-edged sword which cuts sharp and deep into the flesh. He's supposed to make you uncomfortable. He's not supposed to make you feel good. He's supposed to convict you. And he's supposed to correct you. When you're preaching with God's power, your message has the capacity to warn against danger. When you're preaching with God's power, your teaching has the ability to Ability to reprove. And when you're preaching with God's power, your message has the ability to instruct. All these teachings are found in Second Timothy 
chapter 3, verse 16. Can somebody open to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16? So the word of God is good for teaching. It's good for reproof. It's good to instruct. And as a preacher of God, you have to be able to do all this. When you're preaching with God's power, it is living and, and it's active. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It is living and active. Hebrews 4, verse 12. So the word of God has to hurt. It has to make you feel uncomfortable. It has to convict you. It has to talk about the lifestyles, the things of the world that you enjoy and find pleasant to do. It has to be able to convert you and win you from these things. So as a messenger of God, when preaching the word of God, you should not be scared of touching on these topics. You should not avoid these topics because maybe somebody might get offended and stop coming to church. The power of God, the word of God has the power to convert. Acts chapter 17 from verse 10 to 12. The word of God has the power to convert. So we have seen the many things and the many ways that preaching with God's power can have an impact on the life of our listeners. Let me touch base real quick with the listeners. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. You see, us, the members of the church, the listeners, the followers, we also have a duty to perform. We have to study the word of God. We have to know the word of God. Because if you do not know the word of God, how would you know when someone is not speaking the truth? How would you know when somebody is not preaching according to the gospel? So we also have an obligation as followers to learn. See, the word of God says, study to show yourself approved. So we have to be able to do this. First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. He says that people who do not have God's spirit... Do not accept the things that come from his spirit. They think that these things are foolish. They cannot understand them because they can only be understood with the spirit's help. You see, for example, if two lawyers were having a conversation in this room and a doctor is in the midst of them, the doctor will not have any idea what they're talking about because that is not his area of speciality. If two babies were talking, would we understand them? We wouldn't. This is why it's good as Christians for us to also study the word of God to know. That way, when you listen to false doctrine, you'll be able to stand up against it. When you listen to false prophets, we have so many of them in today's times. On Sunday morning, when you turn on your TVs, there's plenty of them. They preach in a manner that only makes people want to come to them and not come to God. 
they are more focused on the size of the church. They are focused on how beautiful the pulpit is going to look on Sunday or what kind of outfit they will wear to church on Sunday. They are not focused on what souls they can win. So as listeners, can you be deceived? Yes, of course you can be deceived. Perhaps a better question to ask yourself is, are you deceived? Are you deceived by false teachings or false prophets? One of the most consistent warnings in the Bible is that human beings are susceptible to deception. We see this problem from the very first book of Genesis, where Eve was deceived by the serpent. Christ warns us about the end times, about false prophets. Let's quickly look at Matthew chapter 24 from verse 4 to 5. See, the Bible says we should study to show ourselves approved so that we will be ready to wield the word of truth at a moment's notice. We must know the word of God and share it as, as God intends, straight without wavering. Let us look at some of the great works accomplished in the Bible through preaching with God's power. When you preach with God's power, you have the ability to save souls. You can even save the city. As we see here, the people of Nineveh received God's pardon and forgiveness. God used Jonah to save an entire city. So God can use you. He could use me. Jonah chapter 3 from verse, from verse 3 to 10. See, in this portion of the Bible, we are going to see how God used one man to deliver an entire city. And also, it was important that the people of Nineveh received the message truthfully. So Jonah did not go over there to deceive them. He went over there to speak the truth for them. Which is why it is important as a preacher, when you're delivering the word of God, you have to deliver it truthfully. Because a person's soul might be at stake. Jonah chapter 3, from verse 3 to 10. If anybody has that, can read said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, 
what is this that you have done? So the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of, of the Lord because he had told them. Amen. So we have all been taxed with delivering the word of God. And we all have to answer that call. At any point in time, you could be taxed with preaching. Do not shy away, for maybe God might choose you. God might be trying to use you to save souls. You see, God chose Moses. When I read that portion of the Bible, I read it over and over again because... I was wondering, why would God choose someone that is clearly saying, I don't have the best words to go and speak on behalf of a group of people. But when the power of God is walking through you, even if you don't have the best words, you have the ability to convince a heartless king like Pharaoh to release the children of Israel. Another example that we see here is that it's recorded in um, Acts chapter 2 from verse 38 to 41. Acts chapter 2 from verse 38 to 41. Wow. 3,000 souls were saved that day. This is the beauty of preaching with God's power. This is why it is very important to speak in spirit and in truth. You see, these people, they asked asked Peter, they said, what shall we do? And he answered to them, he said, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord God will call. And with many words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Because because Peter spoke with God's power. As many as 3,000 souls were saved that day. So what will you do as a preacher when somebody walks up to you? And say, what shall I do? What will be your answer to that person? When a lost soul comes to you and asks you, what shall they do? Will you speak to them according to God's power? Will you be truthful and straightforward? Or will you sugarcoat your words to make them feel better or feel good? You see, the children of Israel were set free in Exodus chapter 12. After Moses gave so many excuses... Many of us today, we give so many excuses on the reason why we cannot take up responsibility in in the church. Moses said that he was not good enough. But I'm here to tell you tonight, you don't have to be good enough. You just have to be connected, connected with the Spirit of God. Moses said that he did not have all the answers. We do not have all the answers, but God do have all the answers. So you just have to be ready for it when God calls you to be a preacher. You have to be willing to preach the truth. He said, people will not believe me. People don't have to believe you. But they have to believe God. For when you speak with the Spirit of God, like I always say, the Word of God has its ways to make it to a person's heart. Your job is to deliver the message truthfully. Finally, he said, 
But last but not the least, he said, I am a terrible public speaker. You don't have to be the best speaker, but you have to be a good speaker for the word of God. Because what if you are eloquent in English language? What happens to the people that speak Spanish? So you have to understand the word of God, and you have to deliver it in spirit and in truth, in any language that you choose. Moses said that he was not qualified. You don't have to be qualified. We are chosen by God. But despite all the excuses, God said to Moses, he said, I will equip you. So God has equipped us with the scriptures. Our job is to read it. Our job is to study it. And our job is to keep to to the truth at all times. We cannot add our own words. We cannot remove any words from it. We have to preach it the way it is written and the way it is given to us. And let God do his own, work, his own works. So the last things I want us to take home today as preachers of God. Number one is humble dependence. Apostle Paul did not re- rely on eloquence or human wisdom. Instead, he came in humility. Recognizing his dependence on God's spirit. This is very, very crucial for us today. As preachers, we must know that it is not by our might, nor our cleverness, that hearts are changed to God, but by the power of God that's working through us. No matter how good you speak or how good you put your words, you don't have the power or the ability to convert or win souls. But if you let God walk through you, you can say a few words. And his soul is saved. Number two, our message has to be centered on Christ. Paul's singular, Paul's singular focus was on Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. The message of the gospel is simple yet profound. It is not about impressing people with knowledge, but about focusing on the death of Jesus Christ. When we preach, let us remember to exalt Christ above all else. Let's not focus on exalting our own names or our own selves. There are people that think that people come to church because of them. They want people to draw near and closer to them. I've seen many people worship their pastors before they worship God. So you have to make sure that when you deliver your messages, it is centered on Christ. Spiritual demonstration. See, Apostle Paul emphasizes that we don't have to do miracles and signs and wonders to draw people to God. We can pray and let God do his will. Faith in God's power. The goal of preaching with God's power is not to make people admire us but it's to ground their faith firmly in God's power. When we preach with the power of the Spirit, we direct people's attention, not to ourselves, but to the one who can truly change lives. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 7. Can somebody read that, please? Ephesians chapter 3, verse 7. Let us approach the task of God by sharing with humility and dependence on the Holy Spirit. Let us keep our message centered on Jesus Christ. Let us pray for power to accompany our words, knowing that it is not by our work that brings true transformation. Let us encourage one another to place their faith not in human wisdom, but in surpassing power of God. A spirit-led servant of God will approach God's wisdom, God's word, with power, without seeking to perform miracles. God does not use men to perform miracles today, as recorded in Hebrews chapter 1, from verse 1 to 2. He preached.
preaches, and then God does his will. Let's commit ourselves anew to preach with God's power, as Paul did. Let us rely on the Spirit and keep Christ central and trust in God to walk in the minds of people. As we go forth, may our faith, may the faith of those who hear rest not, not in us, but in the mighty power of God. I believe that when you preach with the power of God, God will walk with his own power to convert people, to win souls. So tonight, if there's anybody here that's touched by God's power, that listens to the word of God and accepts him as a savior, or if you are in need of prayers, please come forward as we sing. Seeking to rise no more, but the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now say, am I? Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me. Souls in danger look above, Jesus completely saves. He will live to buy his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea, fill us his will obey. He your Savior wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me. This just keeps getting better and better. <laughs> Thank you, men, for who are doing this. Who be you? You did a great, great job, and uh, we, uh, the elders, think this is a great program. <laughs> As we continue to spread the kingdom here, we have more and more men stepping up, and that's so good. Who has the closing prayer? Anybody? No? no? I think we're done. We're dismissed. Be safe and uh, come back uh, Sunday and come back next Wednesday after evening. Uh, Alberto, you're up next Wednesday. And your topic is? The Mind of Jesus Christ. That sounds like worth coming back. God bless you. We're done for tonight.